Hello again uh, from American Amnesia. I am your host, Cliff Garner. And uh, I've been wanting to get around to doing this for a while. I'm going to uh, analyze and read from uh, the, uh, the an Irony of Democracy. This is a uh, fifth edition uh, by uh, Thomas Dye and L. Herman Ziegler. Uh, this was a uh, standard uh, uh, textbook that was being used for political science in the colleges uh, uh, back in the 70s, and 80s, and really into the 90s. I think the I think they only changed it in the last last couple decades. Uh, but but it's a uh, it's a remarkable book, uh, and it went through several editions. This is the fifth edition. I. Th think I was using the first back in 77 when I took a class. Uh, this might actually be my brother Chris's uh, uh, copy. And uh, But I, I've got a couple others too. And I, I, uh, I find it a, uh, a remarkable book. I, it really is. Uh, and and they, the theory they put put forward is uh, either uh, considered a, a elite theory or a more properly uh, a pluralist theory uh, because the elites that, uh, that that are behind the US government in particular are not uh, monolithic uh, they, they're actually quite uh, quite pluralistic they have, they represent a wide uh, range of ideas uh, they might not always agree on everything, but they do tend to uh, uh, tend to work together and uh, work towards uh, uh, what. Well, they did uh, uh, did tend to work towards uh, what that they thought was uh, best. I, I think what what had happened though. I think in the nineties, uh, uh, Lash Christopher Lash uh, notes that the elites. Uh, had uh, not only uh, uh, kept themselves from the rest of us, but they uh, event actually uh, became uh, hostile towards the uh, uh, values that they were once upholding and, uh, and started uh, actually going for the money as opposed to uh, supporting the so-called democratic values and and that that's the thing here uh, uh, Diane Ziegler's uh, one of their theses uh, in fact a core part of their thesis was that uh, that the uh, elites better than the masses were uh, preserving so-called democratic values and this is this is despite the fact that uh, um, that the government is not a democracy per se, but rather it is a, uh, a republic. Now, it is a democratic republic. Uh, democracy is uh, part of the mechanism of the government, and it also represents part of the ideal of the government. Uh, the representative uh, portion is a republican uh, kind of... Uh, um, well, uh, system for one thing, but also ideal that the Republican ideals that uh, were prevalent in uh, England uh, in the uh, 13, 14, 15, and 16 hundreds were transferred to America uh, in a very major way. And uh, <clears throat> that uh, is historically demonstrable uh, but at the same time there was also the the idea of uh, universal suffrage that uh, uh, took root in America very early and flowered uh, not too long after the founding of the, uh, the American independent republic um, after the end of the uh, the Revolutionary War. That uh, 
that democratic part of it um, of equality that there's an essential equality that all men are created equal this part emerges from the Republican values, but it is a more of a, a demonstrably democratic value in that it, that our equality uh, comes from uh, this uh, enfranchisement uh, into uh, the system that uh, we are equal. This, the equality that, that has been achieved in America was not to be achieved in uh, Europe until much later. Um, the Tocqueville talked about it. And uh, this, this is a realistic part of uh, the American character. Uh, that is, uh, that none of us are below uh, the others so we're equal as citizens and and that's the key word citizens this has been forgotten for a very long time and the Democratic Party really doesn't want to look at it but they would like to make everybody else a citizen too that's why mr. Obama had our armed forces uh, uh, reading the rights to uh, those that they took captive in the field in Afghanistan uh, th this is ludicrous. Uh, they're not citizens. They're not protected under our Constitution. They have no constitutional rights. Only citizens do. And those, uh, those legally accepted uh, uh, immigrants and aliens are uh, accorded those rights. Um, that's, that's the thing. And uh, we, we don't conflate that there there is a purpose and value to our citizenship and that uh, that's that's the assumption underlying uh, uh, the the freeing of the black slaves in the Civil War so the, there's no good reason behind accepting illegal aliens as being citizens there is none now, if we make an accommodation, that's fine. I really don't have too much problem with it. But by the same token, it has to be done legally. And it has to be done in a fair way because there's been a lot of uh, legal citizens that, uh, and people going through the process that have been dumped on in the process of allowing illegals to walk all over us. It's no longer acceptable. It wasn't anyway. It never was. It, poor, it put poor black people out of work. It put poor Hispanic citizens out of work. Now there was a, and, and there still is, a, a certain amount of a, uh, the Hispanic community that, the, you know, they want their uncle, their uncle uh, uh, you know, Jose and things to stay. But they don't want the other people's uncle Jose to stay, and and that uh, that underscores some of the problem here. But it, it it's an understandable situation. We understand that people would want their own taken care of, but there's no cause for overthrowing the law in order to do it. So. We'll see on how all that works out. I, I, that's a huge digression. But the fact is, is that our citizenship is worth something. And that, that, that's, uh, this is where the, the divorce between the elites and the uh, regular people, the masses, uh, became a betrayal, actually. And uh, this is where Lash comes in. And that, I think, was pretty well done by the time of the, uh, by the Clinton administration. 
that this uh, this separation between the elites and the masses has been uh, fatal and potentially fatal anyway and it has to be undone the 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 elites had given up on those values whereas the people I think the masses of the people have not and have recognized it that the elites have been been betraying us for some time now so it I think it's a good idea and in matter of fact I think there were other people who believe the same thing and because uh, they were pushing this populist ideal uh, since the 70s uh, because this uh, this disconnect was growing greater and greater by the decade and with uh, the Obama time administration it, it has uh, been, become utterly complete and uh, and it's time to salvage the situation or die trying that uh, I think we saw with the uh, insane uh, activity by certain people within the deep state these very elites that we're talking about and their uh, their narrative with Russia and the, the whole press so uh, coddling towards uh, Obama have been extremely hostile towards the new president I think that these things, plus Obama and his daring to uh, nearly begin World War III with Russia before he left office, that, uh, that I think, uh, really exposes the reality of what Diane Ziegler were talking about and what this is. And it also exposes the disconnect that uh, Christopher Lash goes into in such great detail. And, uh, and so I'm bringing in this part so that you can kind of examine what the deep state, the, the elites are, how they operate, and what were the assumptions prior to the uh, betrayal. And, and yes, indeed, this is a betrayal that they have committed against us. And they do need to be held accountable for it. Uh, I don't think we're going to see too many of them get stuck in prison, but I think a few of them should be. And definitely they should be removed from power, without a doubt. And never, ever to participate in it again. And that does include Mr. Obama. So... To uh, get down to it, uh, the irony of democracy on page one, and uh, I'm going to read a, read a little bit from it with uh, some commentary, and uh, let's lay the foundations here. Elites, not masses, govern America. Very first sentence. Elites, not masses, govern America. In an industrial, scientific, and nuclear age, life in a democracy. Just as in a totalitarian society is shaped by a handful of people. In spite of differences in their approach to the study of power in America, political scientists and sociolo sociologists all agree that the uh, quote, key political, economic, and social decisions are made by tiny minorities. End quote. An elite is the few who have the power, the masses are the many who are uh, do not. Power is deciding who gets what, when, and how. It is participation in the decisions that allocate values for a society. Elites are the few who participate in the decisions that shape our lives. The masses are the many whose lives are shaped by institutions, events, and leaders over which they have little direct command. Harold Laswell writes, quote, The division of a society into elite and mass is universal. End quote. Even in a democracy, quote, 
if you exercise a relatively great weight of power, and the many exercise comparatively little, end quote. Elites need not be conspiracies designed to oppress or exploit the masses. See, this is key. It's not, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is demonstrable truth. On the contrary, elites may be very public regarding and deeply concerned with the welfare of the masses. And I, I think they used to be, actually. Membership in an elite may be relatively open to ambitions and talented individuals from the masses, or it may be close to all except for top corporate, financial, military, civic, and uh, government leaders. Elites may be competitive or non-competitive. They may agree or disagree over the direction of foreign and uh, domestic policy. Elites may form a pyramid with the top group exercising power, uh, in many uh, sectors of society, or plural elites may divide power with separate groups making key decisions in different uh, issue areas. Elites may be responsive to the demands of the masses and influenced by the uh, outcome of elections, or they may be unresponsive in mass mo to, to mass movements and unaffected to elections. You see, uh, that's what we were seeing there, that they were actually trying to firm themselves up against the election, but they couldn't do it. Ah. <laughs> but whether elites are public-minded or self-seeking, open or closed, competitive or consensual, pyramidal or pluralistic, responsive or unresponsive, is elites, not the masses, who govern the modern nation. Uh, democracy is a governance by the people. But the survival of democracy rests on the shoulders of elites. This is the irony of democracy. Elites must govern wisely if government by the people is to survive. If the survival of the American system depended on the existence of an active, informed, and enlightened citizenry, then democracy in America would have disappeared long ago for the masses of America are apathetic and ill-informed about politics and public policy, and they have a surprisingly weak commitment to democratic values, individual dignity, equality of opportunity, the right to dissent, freedom of speech and press, religious toleration, and the due process of law. And, and I think what we're seeing with the, the betrayal of the uh, elites that Lash talks about is that it's the very masses that, that Diane Ziegler are not giving too much credit to that are actually trying to reestablish re those very values. And there are people within the elites. Now, consider this. There are people within the elites that approve. And they see it the same way. So it isn't as if this whole elite theory, uh, theory or this uh, pluralistic uh, theory <clears throat> is just thrown out the window. It's not. There are those within the elites that have been looking for this opportunity as well. And that this idea of populism actually appeals to certain of the elites in, in addition to uh, a large number of the people. Something to keep in mind. Um, fortunately for these values and for American democracy, the American masses do not lead, they follow. They respond to the attitudes, proposals, and behavior of elites. <coughs> so, what we actually are seeing is, uh, is a, um, I don't want to say a hiccup because it's a lot more serious than that, a convulsion within the elites because the, the sellout that has occurred with the uh, great, uh, um, breakdown of elite uh, 
support of democracy, uh, the, and their betrayal of this democracy. And, and, I, and by democracy, I do mean our democratic republic, of uh, which we're talking about. That the betrayal of that republic uh, for a more globalistic uh, uh, version, um, kind of along the lines of what Soros has in mind in his uh, twisted uh, version of Popperite uh, uh, philosophy in the open society, that uh, he that this this betrayal is uh, gone so far upstream that it has required a uh, essentially uh, an un well a bloodless revolution so far uh, a nonviolent one so far one in which uh, we're we're seeing a lot of scuffling behind the curtain the curtain's kind of popping up a little here and there <laughs> because we can see the scuffle going on but we really don't see who's doing what and really where it's going uh, there are compromises that are being reached now and uh, and I, I'm encouraged by some of that but there's some of it that I I'm rather rather worried about uh, to return to uh, yeah, the book here. Um, although the symbols of American politics are drawn from uh, dem democratic political thought, the reality of American politics can often be better understood from the viewpoint of elite theory. Now here we'll, we'll explain this a little bit. Uh, questions uh, po posed uh, by elite theory are the vital ones of politics. Who governs America? What are the roles of elites and masses in American politics? How do people acquire power? How are economic and political power related? How open and accessible are American elites? How do American elites change over time? How widely is power shared in America? You know, opposite being the concentrations thereof too. Uh, how much do elites really compete? Hmm. What is the basis of elite consensus? How do elites and masses differ? How responsive are elites to mass sentiments? How much influence do masses have over policies decided by elites? And finally, how do elites accommodate themselves to mass movements? And, and we're seeing some of these as they're being answered right now. And we've seen them being answered in the past as well. The, the, these uh, questions are not new. Now, now when it comes to uh, it, what I consider advanced political thinking, the real issues of politics are always these. Who rules? What rationale is there that is given for those people to rule? And to what extent are they allowed to rule in the country of, the, of which they have power over? And, and, and you can see why I ask those kinds of questions. They tell you pretty much everything you need to know about any political situation at any given time in history or today. They tell you the nature of the, the political system that's going on. Is it uh, open? Is it free? It can be free and not open. It can be very closed. But it can also be closed uh, and being free. And it can also be open and not be free. Uh, 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 uh. So, so you know, you, you have to examine, you know, who, what, when, how, why, you know, these, these essential uh, questions, and they will tell you uh, what's going on. So those questions about elite theory, uh, they, they, uh, they bring a focus to 
what's going on within the system who who's really in charge and uh what is the relationship between uh those in charge and those being ruled and uh and other uh issues about how power is uh distributed or concentrated concentration is uh, equally important and i i don't think uh diane ziegler really liked talking about that too much um, they, the two of the writers uh, did not agree on, uh, on how they saw this, uh, this, uh, elite pluralism. Uh, one of them was all for it. He thought it was great. And the other one thought, eh, not real hot on this. And I'm kind of, uh, I understand both of their positions. And, uh, the fact is, is that, uh, This is a reality that's going to be faced by any political system that uh, asserts itself. And that there is going to be a certain amount of imposition upon any system that is created by those elements that have the greatest stake in the system as it is at any given time in any given place. That will be always the case. And you're not going to get away from that. There is always going to be those who are going to make more money one way or another. I mean, let's face it, Mr. Obama got pretty rich while he was in office. That is not unusual. Can we justify it? I suppose we could. It's probably legal in his case. He did, he's not making out like Erdogan did, but then there's some of the other more questionable things about monies that are not being accounted for. And there is going to have to be an accounting for those. There is a point where, where it is an abuse of power. That's what we're talking about when we talk about power. We're talking about people abusing it. If he only has an eight-year term, then he should not be able to extend his power beyond that. That's not permitted. That isn't legal. Matter of fact, it's unconstitutional. So, anyway, to return to the book. This book, The Irony of Democracy, is an attempt to explain American political life by means of elite theory. It attempts systematically to organize the evidence of American history and contemporary social science to come to grips with the central questions posed by the elite theory. But before we turn to this examination of American political life, it is important that we understand the meaning of elitism, democracy, and pluralism. And they're very specific about what these are. Uh, first, the uh, meaning of elitism. The central proposition of, of elitism is that all societies are divided into two classes, the few who govern and the many who are governed. The Italian political scientist Gaetano uh, Mosca, or Gaetano Mosca, uh, expressed this basic concept as follows. In all societies, let me, let me get comfortable here. In all societies, from societies that are very undeveloped and have largely attained the dawnings of civilization, down to the most advanced and powerful societies, two classes, two classes of people appear. A class that rules and a class that is ruled. The first class, always the less numerous, perform all the political functions, monopolizes power, and enjoys the advantages that power brings. Whereas the second, the more numerous class, 
is directed and controlled by the first in a manner that is uh, now more or less legal, now more or less arbitrary and violent, depending on the situation. For Mosca, it was inevitable that elites and not masses would govern all societies. Elites are not a product of capitalism or socialism or industrialization or technological development. Those, those things are irrelevant. Uh, that's my comment. Uh, all societies, socialist and capitalistic, agricultural and industrial, traditional and advanced, are governed by elites. All societies required leaders. And leaders require a stake in preserving the organization and their position in it. And, and, and that's the idea of the enfranchising of, uh, of the, the average person. Uh, it, it was originally tied to property. And uh, I think it's still, um, at some level, property is still a, a value that tends to enfranchise people within the system. That's why I was all for uh, the uh, housing uh, market uh, being opened up the way that Bush and uh, Barney Frank did uh, just prior to it going under. Uh, what I wasn't aware of uh, at the time that, that all that was going on was the extent to which they were uh, doing the derivatives of bundles and... Uh, and all, all that kind of nonsense, and uh, they were they were passing off a uh, junk basically as investments that were triple um, A, but they were actually probably more like B minus uh, investments. So you know, the, but that idea, the concept of people owning a home and owning a little land and a car and you know all the other things that go with it. Uh, that by actually ownership uh, tends to bring people within the uh, realm of uh, actually having a stake in the system. Whereas people who are homeless and rootless, so uh, they have no stake. They have no loyalties because they have no reason to be loyal. So, you know, if you look at it from a bigger perspective like that. America, by, by uh, it's including, uh, or actually opening up of a middle class on a, on a massive scale, as it did in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and then it kind of started uh, dying off in the 80s. But by doing that in those peak years, uh, enfranchised an enormous number of people to where they were stakeholders and they really did feel that they were part of the system. That's something that was really not paid attention to by the, by the, by the uh, 60s radicals. They, now, there, there were issues that they were right about. But the fact is, is that there were more people becoming enfranchised had that continued, hard to say where we'd be today. Really is hard to say. Instead, what they did is they deindustrialized and took all the, all the jobs and everything out overseas. And, and the two we can lay the, on the doorstep for that, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. They're the ones that did that. So, anyway, that's... The diversion there. But back to where we were. Um, all societies require leaders and leaders acquire a, a stake in preserving the organization and their position within it. And, and that's, I think, I think kind of obvious, really. Uh, this motive gives leaders a perspective different from that of the organization's members. An elite, then, is an inevitable in any social organization. As the French po political scientist Robert Michel puts it, he who says organization says oligarchy. Hmm. The same is true for societies as a whole. 
According to political scientist, scientist Harold Laswell, the discovery that all large-scale societies, the decisions at any given time are typically in the hands of a small number of people, concerns, uh, concerns a basic fact. Quote, government is always government by the few, whether in the name of the few, the one, or the many. Unquote. Ooh. Oh, power to which people? That's what uh, Alinsky would, had said. Which people are you empowering? Or are you taking power in their name and not giving them anything? I ask you, lefties. Elitism also asserts that the few who govern are not typical of the masses who are governed. Elites control more resources, power, wealth, education, prestige, status, skills of leadership, information, knowledge of political processes, ability to communicate, and organization. And members of the elites in America are drawn disproportionately from among wealthy, educated, prestigiously employed, uh, socially prominent, white, Anglo-Saxon, and prominent, uh, Protestant groups in America. Uh, elites are drawn from society's upper classes, from those who own or control a disproportionate, uh, disproportionate uh, share of the societal institutions, industry, commerce, finance, education, the military, communications, civic organizations, and law. Elitism, however, does not necessarily mean that individuals from the lower classes cannot rise to the top. Uh, elite theory admits of some social mobility that enables non-elites to become elites. In fact, a certain amount of circulation of elites, upward mobility, uh, is essential for the stability of the elite system. This is one of the reasons why uh, Christopher Lash uh, points out that upward mobility was not one of those factors, one of those key factors in making the American character in the time of Tocqueville and during the, uh, the, the years prior to the Civil War. Upward mobility is actually more essential in an elite pluralistic system than in one that is uh, fairly, uh, dare I say, de uh, democratized. In, in other words, one that is uh, socially leveled to where that there is uh, no uh, meaningful uh, class differences. Uh, openness in the elite system siphons off potentially revolutionary leadership from the lower classes and an elite system is strengthened when talented and ambitious individuals from the masses are permitted to enter governing circles. However, social stability requires that the movement of individuals from non-elite to elite positions be a slow, continuous assimilation rather than a rapid or revolutionary change. Uh, moreover, only those non-elites who have demonstrated their commitment to the elite system itself and the system's political and economic values can be admitted to the ruling class. Uh, that you must participate in the consensus before you're allowed into the uh, system. Then that's, that's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, and you can see why they don't want to address class in America uh, because this would otherwise not be the case, that there would uh, be more of a uh, um, an urge, I suppose, by, by the talented to not uh, go upwardly mobile, but actually stay and represent their class. This solidarity in class has never been uh, approached, I suppose. And it's never been encouraged by any means. 
uh, it happened more in Europe because the uh, class differences were much more obvious and uh, not only that, much more clearly enforced. And that is one of the reasons why uh, Marxism took greater root there than it did in the United States. And, and that, I, I think, probably more than any other reason uh, is why socialism uh, in America had to be more of a uh, hybrid. And uh, actually, America is probably more of a social democracy um, than the others, for one thing. But for another thing, uh, that, that, that would be the only form of socialism that would ever take root. <clears throat> okay, back to the book. Uh, elites share a consensus about the fundamental norms of the social system. They agree, upon, uh, little, they agree on the basic rules of the game, as well as on the continuation of the social system itself. So they're not, they're not cashing it in. But what they've done, even, even with the betrayal that has occurred, uh, according to Lash, even with the betrayal, they have maintained the system itself. But they've, but they've enforced a social division that was, that was never really um, completely worked out to anybody's benefit. And, uh, and, and it hasn't been agreed to. There is no social contract on this. This has been done in violation of the social contract. The stability of the system and even its survival depends upon this consensus. According to David Truman, quote, being more influential, they, the elites, are privileged, and being privileged, they have, with few exceptions, a special stake in the continuation of the system in which their privileges rest. Unquote. The elite consensus does not mean that elite members never disagree or never compete with each other for preeminence. It is unlikely that there ever was a society in which there was no competition among elites. But elitism implies that competition takes place within a very narrow range of issues and that elites agree on more matters than they disagree on. Disagreements usually occur over means rather than ends. I'll repeat that. Disagreements among the elites occurs over means rather than ends. Key point to keep in mind. In America, the bases of elite consensus are the sanctity of private property, limited government, and individual liberty. And we see that that, uh, that agreement is uh, having some breakdown. <clears throat> uh, Richard Hofstadter writes about American elite struggles. And this is an extended quote here. Uh, the fierceness of political struggles has often been misleading. For the range of vision embodied by the primary contestants in the major parties has always been uh, bounded by the horizons of property and enterprise. However much at odds on specific issues, the major political traditions have shared a belief in the rights of property, the philosophies of economic individualism, the value of competition. They have accepted the uh, economic virtues of capitalist culture as necessary qualities of man. Unquote. Elitism implies that public policy does not reflect demands of the people so much as it reflects the interests and values of the elites. Changes and in innovations in public policy come about when elites redefine their own values. However, the general conservatism of elites, that is, their interest in preserving the system, means that changes in public policy will be incremental rather than revolutionary. Yeah, that's why there's been this opposition to Trump, actually. Uh, public policies are often modified, but seldom replaced. Uh, key point here. 
Basic changes in the political system occur when it is threatened by events. Ha 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 ha. Elites acting on enlightened self-interest institute reforms to preserve the system and their place in it. Their motives are not necessarily self-serving. The values of elites may be very public regarding, and the welfare of the masses may be an important element in elite decision-making. Ha 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 ha. There we go. Underscore. Big time. Elitism does not mean the public policy will ignore or oppose the welfare of the masses, but only that the responsibility for the mass welfare rests upon the shoulders of elites, not upon the masses. Mm -hmm. Let me read that again. Put this firmly in your mind. Elitism does not mean that public policy will ignore or oppose the welfare of the masses, right? People's good. Um, but only that the responsibility for the mass welfare, right? For the mass good rests on the shoulders of elites. The, the responsibility is theirs, not upon the masses. So when the mass welfare is not being met, Whose responsibility is it? It is theirs. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Finally, elitism assumes that the masses are largely passive, apathetic, and ill-informed. And they don't have to be, but that's what they've done. Mass sentiments are manipulated by elites more often than elite values are influenced by the sentiments of the masses. For the most part, communication between elites and masses flows downward. <laughs> Think about the news, people. Uh, government policies are seldom decided by the masses through elections or by the presentation of policy alternatives by political parties. And the parties are actually growing increasingly irrelevant. Um, although they're trying to prop them up. Uh, for the most part, these democratic institutions, elections, and parties have only symbolic value. They help tie the masses to the political system by giving them a role to play on election day in a political party with which they can identify. My team. Elitism contends that the masses have, at best, only an indirect influence over the decision-making behavior of elites. Elitism is frequently misunderstood in America because the prevailing myths and symbols of the American system are drawn from democratic theory rather than elite theory. Well, that's true. Therefore, it is important to emphasize what elitism is and is not, as to restate briefly what it is. Elitism does not mean that those who have power are continually locked in conflict with the masses or that power holders always achieve their goals at the expense of the public interest. Sometimes they're working for it. Elitism is not a conspiracy to oppress the masses. And that's true, it's not. It does not imply that power is held in, by a single, unpenetrable, monolithic uh, body, or that power holders always agree on public issues. Uh -huh. It does not pretend that power in society does not shift over time or that new elites cannot emerge to compete with old elites. Another fact. Elites may be more or less monolithic and cohesive or more or less pluralistic and competitive. Power need not rest exclusively in the control of economic resources. It may rest on other leadership resources or organization, communication, or information. So money isn't the only thing. And, uh, and same with the uh, land, right? Elitism does not imply that the masses never have any impact on the attitudes of elites, but only that elites influence masses more than that masses influence elites. And uh, if you would consider it, uh, at best, this relationship is a dialogue 
where the masses and the elites communicate. Think about it. And that's, I think, where we're coming to. And I think that's what we're trying to pull here. That's what we've been trying to do. Again, Trump is a message. He's not the messenger. Were he a messenger, it'd be an even stronger message. But he's, he's enough of a He's enough of a message, that's for sure. And the message is, is that we're, we want our power back. We want our country back. We're not, we don't want them to use our country to really bully the whole world. Not the sake of our prosperity and that of our children's. Okay, elite theory can be summarized as follows. One, society is divided into the few who have power and the many who do not. Only a small number of persons allocate values for society. The masses do not decide public policy. Two, the few who government are not typical of the masses who are governed. Elites are drawn disproportionately from the upper socioeconomic strata of society. Three, the movement of non-elites to elite positions must be slow and continuous if stability is to be maintained and revolution avoided. Co-opt as opposed to uh, put down. Um, only non-elites who have accepted the basic elite consensus are admitted to governing circles. Four, elites share a consensus on the basic values of the social system and the preservation of the system. They disagree only on a, number, a narrow range of issues. Five, public policy does not reflect demands of masses, but rather the prevailing values of the elite. Changes in public policy will be incremental rather than revolutionary. And number six, active elites are subject to relatively little direct influence from the apathetic masses. Elite influence uh, masses more than masses influence elites. And that's really where the failing is. And in terms of uh, the great sellout, consider that. We had a mass movement that uprose and nearly uh, overthrew at least the Democratic Party. And that was the party that allowed, allowed the revolutionary people within it and they were, they were basically told, I'm sure, at some point, that they were to preserve the society as opposed to, to destroy it. And that by preserving it, they were going to inherit power. They wanted power and they wanted it right then. It didn't happen. But they were actually working very hard towards that and during the Carter years, uh, that's when the radicals of my age were threatened to get in line or face the wrath of the uh, system which they now were using. That was a great sellout. We'll examine that as we go along and, and later on. I am, a pr I am in the process of putting together some stuff on this. And actually, uh, I do plan to publish some. This, uh, this sellout that occurred in the 70s is the reason why that the radicalism of the 60s just evaporated. Why well, you had uh, the de-evolution de of the uh, radical movement into from a a mass movement on the streets to basically a handful of anarchists who, uh, uh, you know, turn to criminal types of activity. That's that's where that came from, and it it uh, de devolved even further to the point where there was virtually nothing going on even at the colleges. Uh, the only thing that was going on was was a huge amount of political correctness, uh, and uh, that's that does come from cultural Marxism. But uh, I I didn't have anything to do with that. I hated it. Still do. 
And, uh, you know, in my radicalism, I, I gave up on a, on revolutionary politics, actually. I, it came to the point where it was irrelevant. It wasn't going to happen. And, uh, just kind of drifted uh, all the way to the end of the left and found myself somewhere in the right wing. And I found myself in the middle. Kind of, kind of like that a little better. So I talk about being a radical middle, radical center. And when we hear uh, people like Sticks talk about the center, centerist politics, we're not talking about the real center. See, that's where the people are. That's where the people are. But there is a center in the political system. I mean... Yeah, you look at this. And so I'll, I'll wrap up here. But the bell curve, right? The majority of everything is in the middle. That's reality. But politics. This top one is politics with a trough. But the greatest number of people are in the middle of this trough. Why aren't they being represented? Is it because the parties do not come together at that point? I would say so, because according to this, you have two sides pulling apart everything right you got two extremes that's where the that's where the concentration is supposed to be well, that's not true that's not true at all the majority of people are in the middle they always go there that's where they've always been The real center is hidden. It's plastered over by the political system that's trying to create, recreate the country in its own image. And they are failing. They have already failed at doing that. Fight the power, people. Fight the power. <laughs>